Okay, Euro Bears, I'm going to do my very best to make this as short and sweet as possible. Here's the United Kingdom in the late 19th century. The monarch of the United Kingdom in the late 19th century was this individual, Queen Victoria. She is the second longest reign in English history. The longest reigning monarch in English history is the current uh, monarch of the United Kingdom, that is Queen Elizabeth II. Queen Victoria was the Queen of England for an extraordinarily long time. Her reign lasted from 1837 to 1901. Of course, we have a constitutional monarchy at this particular point of time in history, so pretty much Parliament is calling the shots. But she definitely gave her influence to the culture of the late 19th century, which some people refer to as the Victorian era, after Queen Victoria. What does Victorian mean? Well, Victorian not only relates to the era of the late 19th century, but it also relates to the morals, values, and virtues of this era. Like Queen Victoria herself, the Victorian culture was supposed to be chaste and moral. So women were supposed to be dutiful wives, faithful to their husbands, and take care of all things domestic. They were to take care of the home and the children. Men were to be completely faithful to their wives and to be good, hardworking, moral, and virtuous people. To be Victorian would be to be a good Anglican Christian. To go to church, to take care of the poor, this is all part of the Victorian culture. <clears throat> it is in the Victorian era that the, the, the legend of the medieval king of King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table and all these incredible stories of English folklore come back. This is part of the late 19th century English romantic movement, the resurgence of the story of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. It was oh so very Victorian if you needed a model for Victorian morality. Here is Queen Victoria with her husband, Prince Albert of Saxe-Coburg. Prince Albert was himself a German. As you can tell here, she was short. He was tall and skinny. He was he tended to dress like a dandy, and because of his because of his foreign birth, uh, the aristocracy and parliament didn't entirely trust him, which is why he was never allowed to become king. <clears throat> Prince Albert uh, annoyed the aristocracy because he was very much a supporter of free trade. So this was the time of the Corn Law prior to 1846 when the Corn Law got overturned. He over supported the overturning of the Corn Law and really believed that England could grow through free trade. Essentially, Prince Albert's attitude was a rising tide raises all boats and really encouraged Parliament to pass free trade legislation. Oppositely, he did not support imperialism. At a day and age where Britain was creating an empire, or actually they already had an empire, but they were expanding it, uh, he was very much against this. He thought that that was inhumane. One of the most symbolic things that Prince Albert did was create an international exhibition and had it housed in this particular facility. What you're looking at here is a building made out of all glass. This was a phenomenal thing at its time. The glass had to be mass produced. It was an architectural feat to build this thing. The title of this building is the Crystal Palace. And in the Crystal Palace, the international exhibition featured all of these incredible innovations that Britain had developed, such as the seed drill, such as the external combustion machine, the steam engine. This glorified England and the, the Industrial Revolution, the first Industrial Revolution, and it also was a part of, the, of Prince Albert's PR campaign to push for more free trade, more innovation, more capitalism. The late 19th century was the British century. The British had an incredible empire of which Queen Victoria was its queen. Literally, one-fifth of the world's population was part of the British Empire. One-fifth of the entire world's population could call Queen Victoria their queen. Of this entire empire, I would like to focus on India. Now, in India, the British had taken over almost entirely all of India. They had accomplished this with the Seven Years' War. 
in the seven, at the conclusion of that in the 1760s, where they drove out a lot of the French influence, but not all French influence, but most of it. And the British began the process of taking it over. Queen Victoria called India the jewel and the crown of the British Empire because it was so lucrative. There was a lot of money that was made in India, and Queen Victoria honestly just appreciated Indian culture. Now, it's important to know that it was not really the country of Britain that took over India. It was rather the East India Company. So here you have the joint stock company, the East India Company, coming out of Britain that takes over India with the support of the British military. But what you need to know is India, which is a magnificently huge country with a huge population, is essentially governed by a company. Now, what was the company they're getting? Or what were, how are they making money? Well, predominantly tea. Tea became an important cash crop out of India. It went back to India, it went back to England, it became an integral part of English culture, so that every afternoon, if you could, you would have tea time. Take a little break in your day and sip tea. And still today, tea is very much a part of English culture. When we get to the late 19th century and the Industrial Revolution, actually just the 19th century, the entire Industrial Revolution, tea is very important because it's caffeinated and it helps the working class stay awake in their jobs. I think most Americans today, myself especially, were addicted to caffeine and here's where it began. <laughs> the English taking over India. There was another very important cash crop that came out of India and that's the poppy seed. The poppy seed, uh, from the poppy seed, you can make opium. You can make heroin. So how did the British use this? They used this to subjugate the entire country of China. China was a country, a magnificently huge country with an ancient, that it goes back, uh, the, the, the Chinese civilization goes back to ancient times. The Egyptian and, and Chinese civilization are, are two, of the mo two of the oldest, longest lasting civilizations on earth. And the Chinese resisted Western influence, especially English influence. They simply didn't want to trade with the British. And so the British, annoyed by this, decided, well, what we need to do is we need to introduce into China something that they literally cannot resist. So in the northern Indian subcontinent, they would harvest poppy seeds, they would convert the poppy seed into opium, and they would use Chinese middlemen traders who could get very rich, who would buy the opium from the British and then sell it to the Chinese. The Chinese then got addicted to opium by the early 19th century. There will be two major wars, the Opium Wars, uh, in China where they try to fight against the British, but they can't fight against the British because the British have military superiority to the Chinese. This, in turn, will create, by the middle of the 19th century, something called the Taiping Rebellion, which is the worst, bloodiest civil war in all of world history. 20 million people in China will die in the Taiping Rebellion. So compare this Chinese Civil War in which 20 million people die to the American Civil War in which approximately 700,000 people die. It was a terrible, devastating thing, and it was essentially caused by opium. The British essentially are the world's greatest drug lords. They pushed this drug onto the Chinese people, they got addicted, and therefore they became economically subordinate to the English. Back to India, the English uh, members of the East India Company lived in places called bungalows. And here's an example of a nice English bungalow. Many times, these men who were there by themselves absorbed some of the traditional Indian culture and enjoyed the food and the culture and got to understand the religions such as uh, Hinduism in the northern part of India, such as Buddhism. Uh, and so they kind of gen sort of absorbed the, the, the Indian culture. They, they got to know it, essentially. They would hire as their guards individuals identified as sepoys. Now, sepoys are Indians who work for the East India Company. They tended to be, um, and their religion is important here, 
they tended to be either Hindu or Muslim. So these are the sepoy guards. Once again, Indian guards for workers of the East India Company, they tended to be either Hindu or Muslim. The religion plays an important part in this story. With the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869, the British could now get to India uh, in half the time, which enabled them to bring their families. So you had more English families now living in the bungalows. So what this did is it made the English men who were there at the East India Company simply more English. With their wives and children there, they tended to protect English culture a little bit more, and they became slightly more detached from Indian culture, traditional Indian culture, and as you can see here in this particular image, Indians became servants to the English who were there in India. Back to the sepoys. The sepoys were issued particular guns. These guns were the Lee Enfield rifle. If you were going to load and shoot the Lee Enfield rifle, this was a front loading rifle, not to be confused with like what we talked about with the Prussians, the Prussian needle gun, which loads from the rear. You had this particular cartridge. Um, in the, so this would be a cartridge of gunpowder that you would pour into the top of the gun. Take a look at the Civil War reenactor on the right. He is biting off the edge of the cartridge in order to pour the gunpowder into the barrel of the gun. Now, a rumor spread among the sepoys that this cartridge, when it was made, the ends were held together by a grease made from cow, cow fat and or pig fat. Cow, cow fat and or pig fat. I accentuate that because if you know anything about the Hindu religion or the Muslim religion, you probably know that Hindus worship cows. Muslims refuse to eat pigs or any pig product. So the fact that they are told that you must bite into this cartridge is against the faith of both of these religions. This particular rumor that spread throughout the sepoys then starts a rebellion. <clears throat> this is the sepoy rebellion. Now, the cartridge thing was just simply the spark to get the rebellion going. But the sepoys who had the numbers and the Indian people rose up. They attacked the bungalows of the English people. You had families that were being attacked by the Indians who wanted their, essentially their country back. And they had to defend themselves, but a lot of them were captured, a lot of them were killed, sometimes in brutal ways. And this ignited the anger and the vengeance of the British people. Now, it's going to take approximately six months to saddle up the British army and get them all the way into India to extract their vengeance for the Sepoy Rebellion. But what you're looking at here is what the British did in India. They took the leaders of the Sepoy Rebellion, they strapped them to the, to the, to the mouth of a cannon, they, 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 they fired the cannon and they blew people in half. They did this to send a message. This is what we're doing to people who rise up against British rule. Queen Elizabeth, or I'm sorry, not Queen Elizabeth, Queen Victoria was extraordinarily upset, both by the Sepoy Rebellion and how the British treated their, the, the Sepoys that they captured, who were the leaders of this rebellion. So what Queen Victoria and Parliament decide to do is to change the structure of India. No longer is India going to be a continent, a subcontinent run by a company, but rather Victoria is going to rule over India directly. So what happens then is this. The British choose a capital. The capital is Delhi. The queen, or whoever the monarch is at the time, gets to choose the viceroy. A viceroy is essentially the governor of India. And it's a point, And this individual gets their position. They are appointed by the crown. They are appointed by whoever the monarch is. So Queen Victoria chose this guy. Who's this guy? I have no clue. But he is the first viceroy of India. What's interesting is Queen Victoria felt really bad about what happened. And so for the rest of her reign, she will choose, as her personal assistants, only Indian men. So you have images like this, which are quite common in, <laughs> in London in the late 19th century. Queen Victoria, who's dressed in all black with a white veil with her Indian assistants, because she says she loves India, she loves Indian culture, and she wants this to be symbolic of the fact of how she loves Indian people. 
Prince Albert, the husband that she loved very, very dearly, died mysteriously in the year 1859 as a young man. For the rest of her days, Queen Victoria will wear only black to be in mourning for her dead husband and the white veil. She will never, ever, ever marry again. Although she did have a very close relationship with a Scottish man who took care of her horses, uh, there was certainly nothing very physical because her morality was, of course, Victorian. So she simply had a nice, let's say, platonic relationship with that Scotsman. Now, as the monarch of the United Kingdom, she must meet once a week with the prime minister. There were two very important prime ministers at this point in time in British history. The first was Benjamin Disraeli. He was a conservative. He was Jewish by ethnicity, by heritage, but he gave up his Jewish faith to become Anglican so that he could become more accepted by the British aristocracy and by Britain as a whole. But Disraeli's ethnicity is Jewish. He was conservative, and he pushed for the Second Great Reform Bill. What did the great, Second Great Reform Bill do in the year 1867? It provided universal male suffrage. All men have the right to vote. Who did this? A conservative prime minister. Why did he do it, this seemingly liberal reform? He was inspired by Bismarck, because Bismarck provided the German people with universal male suffrage, and they continued to support the conservatives of Germany. But this does not work out in the UK, because when Disraeli becomes prime minister and pushes the second great reform bill, which provides universal male suffrage, they vote in a liberal. William Gladstone is the leader of the Whig Party, the future Labour Party of Great Britain. William Gladstone has a very interesting heritage, a background. He came from a very wealthy aristocratic family, but they made their money in the slave trade. And Gladstone grew up with a heavy conscience, knowing that his money and his position he got from the slave trade. So what he decides to do is be a fighter and a champion for human rights throughout the British Empire, which means getting rid of the British Empire and freeing the people that Britain rules over. So if I can go back to Benjamin Disraeli, Benjamin Disraeli is a conservative who is very supportive of the British Empire. Gladstone, a liberal progressive great speaker, he wants to get rid of the empire. These two men, you should know, will kind of bounce back and forth. Sometimes the liberals are in charge, sometimes the conservatives are in charge. And so uh, Gladstone and Disraeli will kind of bounce back and forth, both being prime ministers at different times. The last thing I want to talk about with Gladstone is how he tries to dismantle the empire by creating something called home rule, which doesn't really dismantle the empire, but rather allows for certain regions to be autonomous. So they'll still be part of the empire, they'll still have the same currency, They'll still have the same military protecting them, but otherwise they rule themselves. Gladstone did this with several regions throughout the empire, but the one I want to focus on is Ireland. Charles Stu Stuart Parnell arose as the Irish man who almost freed Ireland. Charles Stuart Parnell, he's from Northern Ireland. He's an Ulster man. That means he is a Protestant. But he was a great politician. He inspired all Irish people to work with Gladstone to achieve home rule in Ireland. Ireland is going to go free. Gladstone and Parnell were going to do it. They were going to make it happen. And then Charles Stuart Parnell got involved in a sex scandal in the early 20th century. Uh, her name was Kitty O'Shea. She was a married woman. She fell in love with Charles Stuart Parnell. The two fell in love. This became a tabloid sensation. And because of this, his political career was ruined. It was a Victorian era. And even in mostly, all, mostly Catholic Ireland, uh, they didn't like this either. This was a married woman. So a sex scandal stopped the Irish from having home rule. But it's sort of worth noting that uh, this particular uh, individual inspired several different Irish pubs 
throughout Ireland and the United States of America. You may come across a, a, an Irish pub called Kitty O'Shea's, the woman who stopped Irish home rule from happening. And hey, Euro Bears, that's it. Thanks for paying attention. See you in class.